In Lesson 9-7, we talked about the conservation of momentum. A collision occurring between two objects in a closed system conserves momentum. When they collide, they both experience uh, action-reaction pair of forces, so they each experience the same force for the same time. So the impulse momentum theorem told us that a force times a time equals a change in momentum. So what one object gains in momentum, the other one loses the same amount. So in other words, the total momentum doesn't change. And that's what we said. The initial momentum, P sub I, is equal to the final momentum, P sub F. And if we replace the momentum before the collision with the, the sum of the momenta of each object, that would be the mass of object one times the initial velocity of object one, and the same for object two. So M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial is my initial momentum. That will be the same as M1 V1 final plus M2 V2 final. And that was the law of the conservation of momentum. It might also be possible that kinetic energy is conserved as well. And if that is the case, we would say the initial kinetic energy before the collision is equal to the final kinetic energy after the collision, and we would quantify that as one-half M1 V1 initial squared plus one-half M2 V2 initial squared for the kinetic energy before the collision equals one-half M1 V1 final squared plus one-half M2 V2 final squared. In everyday collisions of common objects, kinetic energy is not conserved because energy is transferred to other forms, such as sound and heat. We give these two different types of collisions names. If kinetic energy is conserved, we call that collision an elastic collision. And if it is not conserved, we call it an inelastic collision. Notice that in both types of collisions, momentum is always conserved. However, the elastic collision, by definition, is one in which kinetic energy is conserved and all other co types of collisions where kinetic energy is not conserved, we call it inelastic. I mentioned here, everyday collisions, kinetic energy is not conserved. So that means all the collisions that we're used to seeing every day, anywhere we go and anything we do, those are examples of inelastic collisions. So let's look at some examples of inelastic collisions first, and then we will show you where we can observe elastic collisions. Our first example of an inelastic collision will be a head-on collision of two cars. The most dangerous type of collision between two cars is the head-on collision. During the collision, the two cars form a closed system. Let's make the reasonable assumption that during the collision, the impulse between the cars is so great that we can neglect the relatively minor impulses due to the frictional forces on the tires from the road. Then we can assume that there is no net external force on the two car system. Let's watch the collision. Both cars had kinetic energy before the collision. Neither car has kinetic energy after the collision. So kinetic energy is definitely not conserved. However, momentum is a vector. The momentum of one car in one direction was equal and opposite to the momentum of the other car in the other direction. So their net momentum is zero both before and after the collision. Momentum is conserved in an inelastic collision. Let's look at an inelastic collision between a ball and a floor. How do I know the collision is inelastic? Well, you notice that each time the ball bounces, it does not bounce to its original height. If kinetic energy was conserved, the ball would leave the floor at the same speed at which it came in, and it would go to the same original height. But since that doesn't happen, I know some of the energy is being lost to sound, and also some of the energy is heating up the ball and heating up the floor to a small amount. Is the ball really heating up? Yes. Let's look at another example that confirms that the objects are increasing their thermal energy. Oh, hi, I'm Dr. Baseball, Einstein of the National Pastime. 
hey, I'm studying the thermal energy created when the ball hits the table. The ball doesn't go back to the height from which it was dropped because the collision creates thermal energy. You know, this would be a lot easier if you could just see the thermal energy. And it'd be a lot more fun if it happened in a real baseball game. Well, in 2011, Fox Sports used a thermal imaging camera during the World Series. In this image, you can see the warmer objects, like the player's bare arms, are whiter than the cooler objects, like the ball, which is almost black. Check out this crucial play in the top of the ninth inning. That's a foul ball. And now they're not saying foul ball. Out. Well, what was it? Did it hit the batter's toe and it's just a foul ball? Or was it a weak dribbler to third base for an out? Let's look at the thermal image of this play and then we can see what it was. Let's take another look and see if there's anything that lights up and right off the tip of the shoe. Right, right off the toes. That ball nicked him. But it's out number two. That's right. Did you see the ball and bat turn white from the thermal energy in the collision? Did you see the white spot on the batter's toe from the collision there? Well, let's look at the video one more time. Watch the ball turn white as it hits the bat. See the white spot on the batter's toe? It was just a foul, not an out. Since you probably don't have a thermal imaging camera, why don't you try these colliding steel spheres from Arbor Scientific? Smells like something's burning. That reminds me of Ted Williams. He was the greatest hitter in the history of baseball, and he claimed that when he fouled the ball back, he could smell burning wood. Well, after doing this experiment, I'm inclined to believe him. So with all collisions that we can observe create sound and heat, how is there such a thing as an elastic collision where kinetic energy is conserved? Because for kinetic energy to be conserved, no energy can change to sound or heat. Well, here is an example. If you take a look at this animation, this is an animation of molecules vibrating on the atomic scale. Heat, if you think about what heat is, heat is the vibration of molecules, and sound is the vibration of molecules. So if we only have two atoms or two molecules colliding, how can heat or sound be generated? The answer is they're not. Collisions between atoms and molecules are elastic. However, there are some macroscopic collisions that can come close to being elastic. We can approximate those collisions to be elastic and treat them as elastic collisions, even though a small amount of energy is transferring to other forms. Here's an example of an approximated elastic collision. There is sound being generated, and we know from watching the video that when steel balls collide, some heat is also generated. But in this case, the amount of sound and heat is so small that the kinetic energy really doesn't change very much at all. You, you can tell this because the balls continue to bounce against each other for a very long time, indicating that the kinetic energy is changing to other forms at a very slow rate. A very small amount of energy is lost in each collision. So therefore, we can approximate this collision to being very close to elastic. The inelastic collision of two bodies always involves a loss in the kinetic energy of the system. The greatest loss occurs if the bodies stick together, in which case the collision is called a completely inelastic collision, in this case between a defensive end and a quarterback. The colliding objects stick together and move as one after the collision. Let's add this now to our slide of definitions of collisions. Now we have the elastic collision, the inelastic collision, and the completely inelastic collision, where the colliding objects stick together and the loss of kinetic energy is the greatest. Momentum is still conserved. So if we have the inelastic collision and the completely inelastic collision, that means there are varying degrees to which a collision is inelastic. Let's see how these varying degrees affect 
the impulse or the change in momentum of an object after a collision. In our first example, we'll look at bouncing occurring. So if an object comes in and bounces off something, its incoming velocity will let the incoming direction be the negative direction. Let's just use as an example an incoming velocity of 3 meters per second and it bounces off at 2 meters per second. This is a change in velocity of the final minus the initial or 2 minus negative 3, a change in velocity of 5 meters per second. Then if no bouncing occurs, such as in a completely inelastic collision, we see that our final velocity now is going to be zero. And so our delta velocity is only three meters per second. It is less, the change in velocity is less when no bouncing occurs than when bouncing does occur. So up here, if this number is larger, that means our impulse is larger. Our change in momentum is larger. And let's see how this can affect an object. I have a super ball and a koosh ball. And to show that they're the same mass, I'm going to hang them over a meter stick and use the meter stick as a balance to show that they have the same mass. Hang them over either side and put my finger right in the middle and you see that it balances showing that they have equal mass. Okay, so both the koosh ball and the super ball have the same mass. Uh, the, the super ball of course will bounce off the block, the koosh ball will not. I will release them from the same height, which the string will be parallel to the floor to let you know they're being released from the same height and will strike the block. Okay, no bouncing. Bouncing. Wow. So a greater impulse with the bouncing as opposed to the not bouncing. This is a two and a half inch steel ball dropped on cement at 12 inches. This is a two and a half inch steel ball dropped at 12 inches.